Welcome. Welcome. And um, we also are so happy to announce that all the rest of our programming starts this week. So Wednesday night, we have kindergarten through fifth grade coming back for ICSUS. We have sixth through ninth grade coming back for their programming as well. And that happened last Wednesday, which was really fun to have, have, every, have those, well, just those energetic bodies back. Um, and also our Soul Cafe is, is going, starting up. So that's just a great feeling. And then the following Sunday, we also will have our programming start. So we'll have um, preschool through fifth graders coming back to Sunday school. And we have two um, uh, Bible studies available in between services. We'll have adult forum here in the sanctuary. If you stay for adult forum, we would ask that you stay in the seat that you are currently sitting in uh, next Sunday. And then we also um, will have a blended Bible study in the Heritage Room, which means that people at home or here can attend. And Kim Rimmers will be leading that one. Pastor will be leading the forum again. We do have acolyte training between services today at 9.30, and they need to meet at the sacristy, is that correct? Or right here? Okay, so meet in the sanctuary. So again, welcome, and um, I think it's time to start our, our service. The congregation, please rise. Peace of the Lord be with you all. Please share that peace with one another, but you're not allowed to leave your pews and you're not allowed to touch each other. And say hello. You can, you can do that. our worship continues with the order for confession and forgiveness as followed from the front cover of your bulletin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The congregation may remain standing. The opening hymn is Gather Us In. You'll find that on an insert in your bulletin.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. and the eternal God. You show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Congregation may be seated. number of readings from scripture. The first one is taken from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, beginning at verse 10. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you were a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. And the Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. 
When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die, and he said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush, for which you did not labor, and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night, and it perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Here ends the first reading. The second reading is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Christians in Philippi. Philippians chapter 1. I'll be beginning at verse 21. St. Paul writes, For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And I knew, do not know which I prefer. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ when I come to see you again. Only. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege of not only believing in Christ, but suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that I saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The next reading is also from St. Paul's hand. This time I will be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Again, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. Here in the readings, I would invite the congregation to stand out of respect for the gospel. according to Matthew, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. 
When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock each came, each of them received the daily, usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I gave to you. And am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be the last. The Gospel of the Lord. Hymn number 484.
Please be seated for the children's sermon. Hey, Polly, give me five. Hello, Mrs. Otten. Hi, how are you today? I'm okay. Oh, just okay? Well, yeah, but I'm going to take my first communion. <gasps> That's wonderful, Polly. I'm so excited for no, you. Oh, I'm going to be up in front of people. Oh, that's not a big deal. What if I trip? Oh, um, you won't trip. You'll what, be fine. What if I, what if I, when I drink the wine, what if I make a funny face? Oh, I, I don't think you're going to do that either. I think you're going to be fine. What if I don't do it right? Oh, Polly, you know what I think? I think something else might be bothering you because these are all really kind of little tiny excuses. Is there a bigger worry that you have? Well, yeah. What's that? Um, you know me. I do. I mess up a lot. Oh, uh, well, we all mess up. No, I mean a lot, a lot. Well, sometimes you do, but then that's what we are. We're human beings and we're sinful and sometimes we do mess up. Well, I know, but I, sometimes I do things that are wrong and that are bad. And I mean, I don't mean to all the time, but sometimes I just mess up. Well, I understand that totally. And you know what? I think I I can help you feel better. Well, you know, I, I don't know because I, here's the thing. I just don't know if I deserve communion. Oh, that's what you're worried about. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? I have something for you. Let me tell you about this. What's that? Well, I have a gift for you. A gift? I love gifts. I know you do. And you just told me that you don't deserve communion and you feel bad because you do bad things. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to give you a gift anyway. Okay. Well, um, well I, I don't deserve it. No, you don't deserve this gift, but guess what? We don't give gifts just because somebody deserves something. We give gifts because we love people. Hmm. We love people so much. We know that people are, you know, do wrong things, but we want to show that we still love them. So this is your gift. That's wonderful. Can you take this stuff out? Yeah. Well, would you like to see what's in there? I want to see what's in there. All right. So first I have what we call a chalice. That looks cool. Yeah, and it's got it has wine in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we have a little little tiny canister that has do you remember that from oh, First it's Communion? Got bread in it. From First Communion practice? Yeah. The little wafers. Right. Okay, so they we taste like styrofoam. Well, yeah, they do kind of taste like styrofoam. But they really are bread. Yep, yeah, they are. They, they really are. are. Yeah. Dehydrated. They won't spoil. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, we have the wine, we have the bread, mm -hmm. and you know what? That is something that you're going to receive today at your first communion. Even though I don't deserve it. Even though you don't deserve it, because God said, I'm going to forgive you anyway, because I love you so much. I sent my son who died for you and shed his blood for you, and his body was given for you. When he passed away, when he died on the cross, he ended up taking all your sins away. Did you oh. know that? You know what? I read in the Bible that there was like a place in 1 Corinthians where people sounded like they did things that weren't good either. Yeah, they really did. And Paul had to talk to him, to them. And, you know, you'll hear today in the sermon about them and what Paul told them. So it's like, I don't know, like grace or mercy or something like that. It's called mercy and it's called grace. It's kind of like getting something you don't deserve despite your sin so that you can have eternal life. That's what it's all about. I want that. Yeah, me too. Because we know we're new creatures in Christ. That sounds great. So, Maybe I'm not so nervous anymore. Well, when you go up there and you take the wine and the bread, you don't think about, oh, if I'm going to spill it or drop it. You think about, God, I'm really sorry for my sins and help me do better. And thank you for all of the things you give me and especially your love. That's what comes in your head. So if I'm thinking about that, I probably won't even make a funny face. I... I 
well, maybe, but probably not. <laughs> do you think you so, can do it? I think that's good. I think that we should thank God for that. I think we should, too. Let's pray. Okay. Okay. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. For my first communion day. For my first communion and all of them that follow. <laughs> and I know. And I know. That. That. I am. I am. Special because you love me. Special because you love me. And Jesus died for me. And Jesus died for me. And I'll be with you someday in heaven. And I'll be with you someday in heaven. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank I'll you, see Mrs. You. Auden. I'll see you at the table. Okay. Bye-bye. Morning again. So happy First Communion Day. Our sixth graders are taking their First Communion today in the 1035 service. And they've been looking forward to this day since last spring. I know we're not necessarily having communion today, but I thought that we could talk about it and celebrate with them and, and pray for them as well. Um, because it is a very, very special day for them. Um, and you know what? What I'm going to try to convince them about in the 1035 service is that it's the best, going to be one of the best days of their life. I think sometimes we don't always think about the fact that the sacraments are one of the best parties we can attend, one of the best things that Christ has given us, just like we have a baptism today. Little Addison is going to be baptized, and of course she's sleeping right now, so we're going to hope that she won't be too surprised when the water comes, but it's a special time, and what a blessing for her and her family. When we're baptized, we all also receive by the blood and body of Jesus Christ a membership in the kingdom of heaven. So Addison, you will become a child of God this morning. Happy baptism birthday. <laughs> Let's begin my sermon with a prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. Amen. Did that prayer sound familiar to anyone? Raise your hand if you say this prayer before you eat at the dinner table. Anybody say this? I've prayed this prayer many times with my family, too. It invites our Lord Jesus to be our guest at the table. And I think sometimes after we invite him, we kind of forget that he's there, and then we kind of get in these big discussions. And we need to really remember, right, that he's still sitting there, especially, especially when we get into the big discussions. The common table prayer is one of my favorite memories from childhood. We always prayed it, even in restaurants. And I can remember my mother saying, wait, we need to pray first. And I would sometimes roll my eyes and look around, see if anybody was watching, and then we would bow our heads, and then we would say, come Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts be blah, blah. Okay, did anybody see us? And I didn't realize at that age that it was actually a witness to my faith. All I knew was that I was a little bit embarrassed about praying in front of others. I really didn't understand about prayer at that time or what it all meant. I think I just had a lot of things that took place in my childhood that were kind of a mystery for me for a while. So for instance, in those days, my dad was not just hired as the pastor of a Lutheran church, he was also like the groundskeeper and the custodian, because that way the salary could be a little more for our family. And of course then, the oldest child learned to mow, which I don't know why he always got the rider and I had to push, but... Um, and I learned to wax floors, I learned to dust pews, and I learned to wash the communion ware. And as I looked at the big bottles of wine in the cupboard, I couldn't help but wonder why people were drinking wine in church. And those little plastic looking discs that we saw in the children's sermon sure didn't look like bread to me. There was something quite mysterious about when my mother would come back to the pew after she would take communion and she would bow her head and pray. And I would try to ask her a question and she would say, shh. 
and keep praying. And I was like, what is she praying about? And then there were the Sunday afternoons when we would make calls to members of the congregation together as a family. But sometimes my sisters and I would have to sit out in the car to be like seen and, no, not seen and not heard. Or sometimes we would go in, but we still had to be seen and not heard back then. Anyway, we would sit out in the car and we'd get bored, so we would find this little black box in the glove compartment. And we'd put together what was inside it. So we would find a little bottle, and we knew it had wine in it, and we knew we better not open it. That was one thing we knew. And then we would find something that we could put together. So this would be the chalice. And then there was a little plate in here as well. And we had wafers in there, but we knew again, that was mysterious, we better not play with that part. But we would like pretend to give each other communion, not really understanding it, and then hurrying up and putting this away as soon as we saw mom and dad coming back. So we kind of, kind of kept, or at least I kind of kept thinking, you know, there's just so much mystery surrounding this. And people are eating bread and drinking wine and, I just couldn't figure it out. So I'm sure our First Communion participants today are also a little bit that way, but they've met with Pastor Joel, and they know what communion means and why we take it in church as the sacrament. But we also saw Polly still a little worried. And he was very worried about how and what to do, but even more, whether or not he should even come to communion, whether he deserved communion, because all he could think about were his sins. He feels guilty. And if I were to give a title to my sermon today, it would be called, then, something like, God isn't fair. Or, God is not fair. And I'll explain why I say this. So I could actually walk up and down the streets holding this sign and everybody would wonder what I'm doing. There's a lot of signs being held lately, right? But this one, I think, is pretty special and I'll tell you why. So we'll talk about the sermon text to do that. I chose the passage from 1 Corinthians, which was basically a letter Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. He was looked upon as a leader of many of the first churches that were established after Christ rose back up to heaven. We're going to divide the text into two parts. Let's take a look at verses 23 through 26 first. So Paul says, I receive from the Lord, and he's talking about communion, what I also pass to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, do this in remembrance of me. And he didn't say, this represents my body, he said, this is my body. Hmm. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, he didn't say, this wine represents my blood. He said, this is a new covenant in my blood. And I think that when I remember hearing about this, uh, when I attended confirmation myself, I remember my dad explaining a little bit about how all four things are there. The wine, the blood, the body, the bread, the... I just kind of wrapped my head around it the best I could, and then I realized that it's a gift. It's a gift that Christ is giving us. So when we hear this text on Communion Sundays, we know that we need to come to the table as repentant sinners, but then I always wonder, what about whether we're worthy of coming to the table, just like Polly was worried about whether he was worthy. And earlier in the introduction of the sermon, I told the First Communion class that this would be the best celebration of their lives. And I'm serious, but are we worry, worthy to participate in this celebration, and why will it be the best? 
So let's find out more by watching this video clip. The Lord's Supper. Who is worthy and what are its benefits? As you learn about what's being handed over at the Lord's Supper, Christ's last will and testament, it naturally leads to two questions. First, who is worthy to participate in this sacrament? Am I Christ's heir? And second, if I am Christ's heir, what do I get? To be sure, both the questions and answers can make people uncomfortable. Why? Well, simply put, not everyone's excited that Jesus treats sinners unfairly. You see, when you receive the Lord's Supper, Jesus doesn't give you what you deserve. He doesn't balance the scales. Instead, you get mercy. So what's the problem with the gift of mercy? Gifts can make people uncomfortable because you don't control whether or not you're going to receive one. Gifts aren't something you can earn or deserve. With this in mind, sinners will try to turn the tables on Jesus as a a way to take a little control back. People will talk about having to contribute something or behave in a certain way in order to be worthy of forgiveness. But there's a problem here. To say you are worthy is to say you don't need mercy. When you're at the mercy of Jesus, our Lord has you exactly where he wants you. You're trapped in your sin and you have to watch him treat you in the most unfair way possible. He forgives you your sin. So back to the first question. What makes you worthy to be at the Lord's table? The answer is simple. Know you are trapped in your sin and that Jesus is going to deal with you in an unfair manner by giving you his mercy. The only thing that could trip you up is not believing that Jesus meant what he said. That when he hands over his body and blood for you in the bread and wine, he is treating you unfairly by forgiving all your sin. Now to the second question. What do I get in the Lord's Supper? What are its benefits? Simply put, Christ's own words tell you exactly what you inherit as his heir. The forgiveness of sin. This is the biggest gift you can ever receive. When you hear Christ's promise, when your sins are forgiven, a whole new world opens up. A world of forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life. A life of freedom. This is most certainly true. So the answer is, who is worthy? No one. We are Christ's heirs, but we are unworthy of forgiveness. We often talk about what is fair and not fair in this world, but God is actually being unfair to us. If he were being fair, we would get what we deserve, which would not be good. It would be death. We don't deserve anything else. No amount of good works will earn us the right to be worthy. No amount of love shown to others will erase our sins. Our sentence is death and we're trapped in our sins. So I have to tell you here that I'm really thankful that God is being unfair. If he were being fair, we'd be in big trouble. Wages of sin is death and all that, but there is hope. Like rays of sunshine that rose up with the sun on Easter morning, Jesus Christ defeated sin and gave us a gift. The definition of the word gift is to give something willingly without expecting payment. A gift we will never deserve or be able to pay for is what Jesus Christ gives us. It's the gift of mercy. The gift that keeps on giving every time we come to the table to receive Christ's body and in, with, in and with the bread and Christ's blood in and with the wine. It's the forgiveness of our sin after we confess them, which in turn gives us something that is totally unfair for us to receive. Mercy, salvation, and heaven. Now what about the second part of Paul's letter to Corinth? Let's look at verse 27. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Didn't we just say that we all receive mercy and grace and forgiveness unfairly from God? And all's right with the world? And now Paul says we must not receive communion in an unworthy manner. But we just said we're unworthy. 
And then he tells us to examine ourselves. So it sounds like we need to do something before we come to the table. So what's going on here? I decided to search for some historical background as to what was going on at Paul's time. And I found a commentary by Richard Carlson, who is a New Testament professor at a Lutheran theological seminary. And here's what he thinks was happening. There were people from all walks of life attending the first churches, often in people's homes. There were the rich, the manual laborers, the slaves, and women and men. When they all came together for worship, they were usually at the house of someone who was wealthy. So not all were gathering at the same time because many of the poor or slaves had to work long days. Those who arrived earlier were served the better food and wine because they were the wealthy. And slaves and manual laborers could only come after they got off work and they received the leftovers, if there were any, leftovers of communion, the unity of the community was fractured by their social differences. So Paul reminded the church in verse 27 that their actions at the table are an act of proclamation regarding Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, and the act of all coming to the table without social class or distinctions was important. And back in those days, this was a scandalous idea and totally unheard of because scandalous means causing general public outrage. Social classes did not mix. But Paul was clear. The witnesses at the Lord's table should be an example of what the cross makes possible for everyone. The church is called to this proclamation until he comes. So remembering Jesus rightly demands a willingness to relinquish one's high status, to stand in solidarity with those who have nothing, the poor and outcasts. This would also include people of all races and all cultures opening their lives to the transforming power of Jesus. So rather than reinforcing social distinctions, Jesus debunked them. And any celebration of the Lord's Supper that fails to demonstrate this scandalous message of the cross is not the Lord's table at all. All are included when they accept Christ into their hearts. All are untreated unfairly. They do not get what they deserve, they get mercy. And then finally in verse 28, Paul says, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. So as the church today remembers the death of Jesus, we should also remember that we want to examine our table practices and ask ourselves whether what we are practicing is indeed the Lord's table. A table where all are welcome and our fellowship proclaims the scandalous message of God and his grace. So coming to the table in an unworthy manner would be to leave others out of the promise of Christ. And we come to the table with a contrite heart, which means before we come, we confess our sins and receive the forgiveness of Christ, as this happened at the beginning of our service, even today. This powerful part of our service that we, it is something I think we take for granted sometimes. We don't realize that something's actually happening when we confess and then receive forgiveness. This is why my mother came back to the pew and said a prayer of thanksgiving. Her sins were forgiven and she received mercy and she was thanking God. She didn't want to be interrupted. So let's have a scandalous celebration to celebrate that God doesn't play by our rules. As the book of Matthew stated, the first will be last and the last will be first. And the more uncomfortable we become, just like those workers who were paid the same for different work, the closer we are to understanding that's the meaning of grace. Who ever heard of such a scandalous thing? So I'd like to close my sermon with the lyrics of a song called That Beautiful Scandalous Night, which I believe summarizes what we've been discussing. And that this promise is not just when we receive Holy Communion or baptism, but it's an everyday promise, a promise for all. And if we only think about the mercy we receive, we know we are God's in God's hands. Here it is. 
go on up to the mountain of mercy, to the crimson perpetual tide. Kneel down on the shore, be thirsty no more, go under and be purified. Follow Christ to the holy mountain, sinner, sorry, and wrecked by the fall. Cleanse your heart and your soul in the fountain that flows for you and for me and for all. At the wonderful, tragic, mysterious tree on that beautiful, scandalous night, you and me were atoned by his blood and forever washed white on that beautiful, scandalous night. Thank God, God doesn't play fair. And now let's join together as one people to attend the best celebration of all, another baptism. Amen. The congregation may rise as we sing the next hymn. of baptism begins with an explanation of baptism. In baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father frees us from sin and death by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are born children of a fallen humanity. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are reborn children of God and made members of the church, which is the body of Christ. Living with Christ and in the communion of saints, we grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. Do you present Addison for the sacrament of holy baptism? If so, answer, we do. We do. As you bring your child to receive the gift of baptism, you are entrusted with responsibilities. 
to live with her among God's faithful people, to bring her to the Word of God and the Holy Supper, to teach her the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, to place in her hands the Holy Scriptures, to nurture her in faith and in prayer, so that your children may learn to trust God, to proclaim Christ through word and deed, to care for others in the world that God has made, and to work for justice and peace. Do you promise to help your children grow in the Christian faith and life? If so, answer, we do. And as a godparent, do you promise to nurture this person in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit to help her live in the covenant of her baptism and in communion with the church? If so, answer, I do. And people of God, do you promise to support Addison and to pray for her in her new life in Christ? If so, answer, we do. So first I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus to reject sin and to confess the faith of the church. So do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? If so, answer, I renounce them. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? If so, answer, I renounce them. And do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? If so, answer, I renounce them. And then the entire congregation, let us confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed um, that is printed in your bulletin for you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family, and through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit, and by the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection you set us free from the power of sin and death and to raise us up to a new life in you. Pour out your Holy Spirit the power of your living word, that those who are washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. To you be given praise and honor through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Are you still sleeping, Adeline? Adeline? Addison, Addison, come here. Oh, I gotcha. This one? There we go. Oh. Yeah. I gotcha. I gotcha. How are you? Oh, my goodness. Addison Dawn Reimers, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. How many of you guys wish you could sleep that well? <laughs> okay, you got her. There she is. Here you go. Take that too. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O oh God. That through water and the Holy Spirit, you give your daughters and sons new birth, cleanse them from sin, and raise them to eternal life. Sustain Addison with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge, fear of the Lord, and the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Addison, Don Reimer's child of God. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked now with the cross of Christ forever. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I think we should go ahead and um, welcome Addison as the newest child in the kingdom of God and the newest member of First St. Paul Lutheran Church. I think that's kind of worthy of us. Yeah, there we go. All right. Thank you.
I invite the congregation to rise. As we pray, I will end each prayer petition with the words, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond with the words, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Generous God, you make the last first and the first last. Where this gospel challenges the church, equip it for its works of service. Strengthen those who suffer for Christ as they continue to do your work. Lord, in your mercy. Sun and wind, bushes and trees, farms and great cities, nothing in creation is outside your concern, mighty God. In your mercy, tend to it all. Give us a spirit of generosity toward all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy. Where we find envy and create enemies, you provide enough for all. Bring peace to places of conflict and violence, especially in our own country, as we continue to disagree with one another at the approach of another presidential election. Inspire leaders with creativity and wisdom. Bless the work of negotiators and peacemakers. Lord, in your mercy. Reveal yourself to all as you are gracious and merciful and slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. Give fruitful labor and a livelihood to those who seek work. Lord, in your mercy. Even beyond our expectations, you choose to give generously. Grant life, health, and courage to all who are in need, especially those who have been hospitalized this week, Marge Eitzman and Pierre Listow. Lord, in your mercy. We praise you for the generations that have declared your power to us. Give us faithfulness to follow them, living for Christ, until you call us to join them in the joyful song around his throne. Lord, in your mercy. Bless those who are taking their first communion today. Catherine, Jackson, Graham, Adeline, Sienna, Georgia, Peyton, Addison, Faith, and Charlie. Give them the assurance to know that though none of us are worthy, you have given us the gift of your body and blood so that we may have eternal life with you. Lord, in your mercy. We rejoice, Almighty God, in the gift of love. We ask that you would be with Zach Eckert and Celine Lake as they were married this last weekend. We ask that their marriage may be one that is lifelong in duration and that they may find love and joy in each other. We rejoice also in the baptisms of Joseph Robert White, who was baptized last night, and Addison Dawn Reimers, baptized just a minute ago. We ask that you would bring them up in the love and the fear of the Lord. Bless their families with the strong inclination to make sure that you are known in their lives. All this we pray through Christ our Lord, Lord, in your mercy. For all of these things and for whatever else you know that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he look upon you with favor and give you his peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Congregation may remain standing for the closing hymn.
in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Please allow the ushers to help you out so that we maintain all of that social distancing stuff that we're supposed to do. So you may be seated as until they come and get you.